Good morning. Well, as Pastor said, my name is Lowell Scott. I am uh, a non-practicing attorney. I'm just going to admit it right now. Um, there are a few of us who are Christian and also went to law school. It was my midlife crisis. I'm serious. I didn't start till I was 48. Um, however, it's not what I do for a living. I uh, am in the hotel business. And if you were ever thinking about getting in the hotel business, this would be a terrible year to do it. So <laughs> i just tell you that also. So it's a pleasure being here this morning. I appreciate you getting out of bed and being here. And for those of you who are watching from bed, um, well, slacker. Um, <laughs> we are in a, an unusual state, not just because of pandemics, but because of what we know is happening. And we all feel it. Things are not the way they should be. Our country, our society, our civilization is being challenged in so many ways. We feel a split. We feel the divisiveness. What in the world is going on? And the answer is, what in the worldview is going on? We're going to, I'm going to talk to you today about the state of the church, and I want to clarify right up front that the church, when I say that, I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about the church, the church of Jesus Christ in the United States of America primarily, in an encompassing sense. We live in a day when the sign out front of a church, it used to be denominationally, you could look at the sign and get a pretty good idea where they were at, what they believed, and what you would find inside. That's not necessarily the case anymore. You almost have to go inside the church, meet the leadership, and listen to a few sermons before you figure out where they're at. Because not every church is biblically based. Sadly, some have become much more focused on membership growth than spiritual growth. So... But it starts in our homes. Do you realize that the average Christian home owns seven Bibles? Various translations, Bible in a year. Some have fewer, some have less, but that's the average, seven. And what most of them have in common is they are dusty. Nobody's opening them and reading them. And it shows a little bit of what I'm going to get into today was touched on very well last week on Sunday. If you haven't seen Pastor Jeff's sermon from last week, you should go back and watch it. I watched it, I think, two or three times this week. It's worth your time. So I'm not saying that we are failing in every respect, but we are failing to teach believers in Jesus Christ, how to connect the dots between what the Bible teaches us and how to apply it in our everyday lives. This is especially true in our young people. So we look at the Barna study, who's George Barna is probably the premier pollster on issues of faith. And he said this, Homes that consider themselves to be born again. Christian homes. Only 14% say the Bible is read daily in their home. We have a nation of Christians that are biblically illiterate. And we're going the wrong direction. We're not gaining in that area. We're failing. Too many people showing up on Sunday morning and saying, tell me what it says. Instead of coming to be fed and empowered, recovered, and go back out. This is not a hospital for sinners. This is for us to come, recover, and go back. We've turned it into a nursing home too many times. We want to sit here and whine all about our aches and pains. But we're supposed to be recovering to go back out onto the battlefield where we stand, where we are the manifestation of hope for the church of Jesus Christ. 
and we need to recover that. Pastor mentioned that this is not a political deal. Well, I would tell you, every church should tell you how to vote, biblically. Vote biblically. It's not about party. Because the divide in our nation is often interpreted as a political one, it is not. It is seen oftentimes as a division between right and left, it is not. It is a division between right and wrong. It is a moral chasm. And that comes down to your view of the world, how the lens through which you interpret what you see going on. It will affect how you vote, how you participate in a representative republic, whether you participate, the rule of law, how you see what's happening on the front page and interpret it through the lens of your worldview. Part of loving God and part of loving your neighbor is an attempt to connect the dots between how things are and how they should be if we embraced and lived by the scriptural principles taught in the Bible. We are not naive. We know our nation's struggling. Something's wrong in our society. Something's wrong in our schools. Something's wrong in our government. Frankly, in our churches. When I was a child, my mom and dad would take me down to the bus station in downtown Des Moines, put me on the bus. I was probably eight years old with my sister and my BB gun. And we would ride up to Madrid, Iowa. It's not that a terribly long bus ride where my grandparents would meet us and put us in the car and take us out to the farm. And on Sunday morning, we would go to church in Luther, Iowa. If you've ever been to Luther, Iowa, you weren't there long unless you touched the brakes. I mean, it's, it's, here comes a nice town, wasn't it? But what it had was as you stood in front of the church, you could see the spires of about five different churches. And almost everybody in that area was in one of them. Now, according to my grandfather, who had his opinions, most of them were in the wrong church. <laughs> I won't name it, you know, but different denominations. But you see, what they had was because they were all in a church, there was a Christianized safety net, if you will, in their culture. They had a moral underpinning that they all shared, even though they may differ on some of the differences doctrinally. That's no longer the case. My grandfather's faith was never questioned. He could believe what he believed. Your grandchildren and your children's faith is questioned every day. And they're going to turn to you at some point and say, how do you know what you believed to be true is true? And your job as a believer in Jesus Christ is to have an answer for everyone for the hope that lies within you. Are you comfortable? Are you ready to give that answer? Because there are others waiting to answer that question for your children and grandchildren and their answer will likely not be the same as yours. This is your responsibility, and we have to be prepared for it. There's mega churches, some even here in our own state, that claim a lot of members, but they're doing very little to change a society. They are failing to be salt and light. We have Christian universities, Christian publishers, Christian TV, radio. We got Christian everything, everywhere, and what's happening? If we're honest about it, we're struggling. So why are Christians not effectively engaging the culture? Let's take a glance at the state of the church today. Back to Barna, this recent poll. First thing we need to do is define what is a biblical worldview? What's it mean to say, I have one or I do not? Six things. We'll start with just six. He had a lot more. We're going to narrow it down to the top six. Number one, 
you believe that there is such a thing as absolute moral truth, that it exists, that it is not dependent on your circumstances. In other words, some things are always right and some things are always wrong. Moral Relativism. It's a great book called Your Feet Firmly Planted in Midair. Because everything's relative. And you determine what truth is to you. And that doesn't have to be the same as the person next to you. That's not an absolute moral truth. It's an appealing concept. Because nothing's right and nothing's wrong. Nobody can tell you that you're doing the wrong thing or the right thing. But the fact of the matter is it's just simply not true. A Christian worldview says some things are always wrong, some things are always right, and that there is such a thing as an absolute moral truth. Number two, that the Bible is inerrant, that it is 100% accurate in all the principles it teaches. Number three, Satan is real, either as a force or a being, but he is not symbolic. There is another team on the field, and that's called Satan. Number four, you cannot earn heaven by being good or your good works. That's not to say that we shouldn't be busy. We surely should be. But it's not our salvation. Number five, Jesus lived a sinless life on earth. And number six, God is an all-knowing, all-powerful creator who rules the universe yet today. Those six things, if you believe all those six, then by Barna's definition, you hold a Christian worldview. So what's the results? American adults, 9%. Now contrast that to 50 years ago, it is a stark difference. 9% of American adults. If you break it down to a subgroup of people who claim to be born-again Christians, okay, so these are people who say, I'm a self-identified born-again Christian, and do I believe all six of those? 19%. If you look at it, general population versus born-again Moral truth is absolute, unaffected by circumstances. Only 34% of the citizens of this country believe that to be true. Amongst born again, less than half, 46%. Bible's inerrant. It's easier. Half of the general population believe it. Almost 80% of people who identified as born again. Satan is real. 27% in the general population, 40 amongst those who say they're a Christian. It's impossible to earn heaven. Only 28% of the general population believe that's true. 47% of Christians, which means over half of Christians think you can earn your way into heaven. Jesus led a sinless life, 40% of the population, 62 of Christian homes. God is all powerful. There is a comfort to people in knowing that God is there and all-powerful. 70% of the general population buy into that. 93% of Christian homes. Where is it worse? The younger you get. Millennials, 18 to 36-year-olds, 2% hold a biblical worldview. When you see people in that age group in church, encourage them. They are alone in the field in their peers and they know it. We need to come around them. If you go to 18 to 23 year olds, it's half of 1%. I don't think that's somewhat, that's probably terribly uncommon. I think I'm further along in my walk than I was when I was 18. I'm not sure where I would have self-described at that point in my life either, but I had a culture that supported me in my sanctification walk. That's not necessarily true any longer. 
We have one that ridicules you, that marginalizes you. And it's hard. It gets different. You can look into denominations. You can look into political party. You can look at parts of the country. He breaks it way down into different details. And I'm not an artist. So you're going to have to bear with me. This is a triangle. That's as close as I get, okay? And I, my penmanship stinks. So you're going to have to... Uh, Bear with me. But this word says beliefs. Beliefs is foundational. What you believe, that's what we were just talking about. A Christian worldview, a pagan worldview. It all depends, it all rests on what you believe. On that, you will find your values. That's a water line. And up here are your actions. As an individual, when we watch you, all we can see is what's above the waterline, your actions. But what determines your actions are your values and your beliefs. That is what the world sees. But how you respond in any given circumstances is dependent on what your values are and your beliefs. A worldview determines how you respond to life as life happens. It's your decision-making filter. It enables you to sense and make sense of the complex there's a huge amount of information bombarding us every day in our culture. The experiences, the relationships, the opportunities, all that we come into and face in our lives, it helps us to clarify what you believe to be important, true, desirable, how you view the world, the lens through which you view life will make a dramatic influence on your choices in any given situation, and your choices will be reflected in your actions. Media use. What media is okay? What's not? What you're willing to view on the internet? What you think is wrong? Profanity, gambling, alcohol use, honesty, civility, moral choices, how we treat others. All of those are determined by your beliefs and your values. But it's your actions we see. George Bonner said this, this worldview division that we're seeing Here's why it's deeply disturbing to him. And he said it this way. We are experiencing a nation of significantly divergent worldviews. It suggests that we are a nation at war with itself. We are being pushed to adopt new values. A redefinition of what's right and wrong. New lifestyles and a new identity. In other words, there is a battle for your mind. There is a war for worldview dominance. And the scriptures remind us, Matthew 12, 25, Mark 3, 24 and 25, Luke 11, 17, all remind us that a nation at war with itself cannot persist. We are in an uncomfortable spot that we sense in our spirit because we are in an uncomfortable spot. Our nation has decisions to make. Our churches have decisions to make. I applaud this church for doing this. Too many churches have abandoned the field and given up. We'll go with the flow. It's great if you just want to be big. But I don't think it's ever been about being big. It's about being right. This is eternity. You don't want to be wrong. So, well, you can have eternal life. Trust me, you're going to have eternal life either way. It's just a question of where you're going to spend it. You're going to be alive and well, or you're going to be alive in hell. And too many people, too many churches, I remember 
I see my, one of my sons in the back. He was heading to church one Sunday and he told, called his mother and she was quite proud he was going to church. Rightfully so. He was, I'm proud of you, you're going to church. And she said, where are you going? And he named the church. And she said, I'll go back to bed. <laughs> and I thought, oh gosh. And he's, he's like, well, what's the problem? And she goes, they're passing out water bottles on the way to hell and telling you it's going to be air conditioned, you're all going to be okay, and it's a lie. <laughs> There's a lot of those churches today. You want somebody who loves you enough to tell your truth, and if you're not sure you got somebody, call your mom. <laughs> Go back to those six statements. Let me read them real quickly. You believe that there's an absolute moral truth, that the Bible's 100% accurate. Satan is a real force. It's not symbolic. You can't earn by being good or good works your way into heaven. Jesus lived a sinless life, and God is all-knowing, all-powerful creator who rules the world and the universe yet today. Here's the executive summary. 91% of all adults who say they are born again don't believe all six. 9% do. One in nine people who claim to be born again. That means they do not have a biblical worldview. 98% of all, teacher, of all teenagers do not agree with all six. This is why the Church of Jesus Christ is losing our influence in society. We are failing to be salt and light in a fallen and dark world that desperately needs the light. Believers are to be that hope. Until our natural deaths or Christ's second coming, we are to be found busy representing his hope. But if you look at the facts and the numbers and the statistics, most believers are living no differently than the pagan next door. Sadly, they're almost comfortable in it. Society is infecting the church rather than the church affecting society. When you think like the world, you will behave like the world. So what's the consequence? Well, let me put it this way. You may at times feel like you're touring a sewer in a glass-bottomed boat, but ships don't sink because of the water around the ship. Ships sink because of the water that gets inside the ship. This has always been true. Christians have always stood out from the culture. You, oh, they say, well, ab abortion. They'll say, well, that's a political issue. Don't go there. No, it's not. It's a biblical issue. God says life matters. It's a biblical issue. And we say, well, it's a current issue. No, it's not. In the Roman days, if you didn't want your child, you took it out to the edge of town and you left it. Just abandoned it. Who started the practice of going out and getting those babies and saving them? Christians. Hospitals. There was a reason when I grew up, you had the Methodist Hospital, you had the Mercy Hospital, you had the Lutheran Hospital. It was Christians who cared for people who were sick. We were salt and light in the public square and we never apologized for it. And now we're not sure we even want to raise our hand. And the consequence is that millions of people have accepted Jesus Christ as their savior. But very few have accepted him as their Lord. And there is a world view of difference. Tozer, and if you ever want to read, so I call them Tozer's Tasers. A.W. Tozer, in my opinion, was a prophet. He died in 1963, but his writings from the 40s and 50s are so applicable to today. He's got a great essay called The Great God Entertainment and how it was infecting the church back in the 50s. But he said this, we have a church today, and by today he meant in the 50s, we have a church today that 
We want to do all the living after we come to finding Jesus as our salvation, our Savior, but we expect Christ to be the only one doing any dying. The Bible tells us we are to die to ourselves. That's uncomfortable. We just want Christ to do the dying for us. Just die on the cross, get our eternal life assured. We got our spiritual life insurance. We went to the front of the church. We're good. Now we can go back out and live out there just like the pagan next door and think we're going to change a society for the better. It's not going to happen. It's on us. It's on our responsibility. You can't just accept an offer. You have to have a life transformation. We need repentance. We need a pursuit of holiness from that point on in your life. That's that lifelong pursuit. Yes, you're immediately justified. Justification's a wonderful thing, but it's the first step. After that, you need to pursue holiness. That's why you shouldn't be the same person in your Christian walk later in your life as you were when you first came to the Lord. If somebody said to me, tell me what day, tell me about your life. And you said, okay, well, I was born on picket birth date. And you stopped right there. They said, well, no, what about your life? Well, that, that's what I was born. We would go, that's just silly. And yet I hear Christians all the time say, I got saved on this date. That's just as silly. It's not, it doesn't stop there. It starts there. Your sanctification is a lifelong pursuit. And in that sense, you're growing. But that only happens if your Bible isn't dusty. That only happens if you are surrounding yourself with believers. That only happens if you're making a point of getting to church and a good church that's teaching biblical scriptural principles and putting them into practice out there in the world. And it's not easy. That's one of the reasons I believe Christianity to be the absolute truth, because if I was gonna invent a religion, this wouldn't be it. I mean, I could come up with a really good religion that's very attractive. It's hard to be a bad Christian, let alone a good one. It's a challenging faith, but it's truth. And we need to recognize it. Now, there's a lot of competing worldviews. There's a lot of them out there, different views of the world. Deism, an absent God. Naturalism, what you see, the natural world is all there is. Nihilism is just a denial of existence. How they're even there and to be nihilistic, I never quite understood that one. Existentialism. We exist, but it's just a meaningless reality. Postmodernism, which is essentially just hyper individualism. Pantheism, everything is God, God is in everything. The big one is probably humanism. Some call it secular humanism, call it, call it Marxist humanism anymore, some call it cosmic or new age humanism. But it's essentially I, it's all about me. I think the first known example of it was probably the serpent in the Garden of Eden when he says to Eve, do you want to be like God? Sure. She's basically saying, he's saying you can become your own God. And a lot of these isms, that's what they offer you. But what you end up getting Almost every sin is just the overemphasis of I. It's all about me. And when it's all about you, it'll almost always lead to sin. We're supposed to die to self. Let's take an example. I don't know. It used to be if you, had a, if you were married and you had an affair, that was wrong. In my house, it still is. Tamara makes that very clear to me. <laughs> I remember then the, uh, there was some scandals politically way back and they were determining what the word is meant. And uh, she clarified that for me. And so we have an understanding. 
But if you go, if you're a deist, is it wrong to have an affair? No. Do you believe in naturalism? No, I'm just behaving like the animal I am. If you deny existence as a nihilist, it doesn't matter. So nobody's going to tell you it's right or wrong. If it's a meaningless reality and you just exist, why not? Postmodernism, pantheism, all of the humanisms, they don't really care. What tells you it's wrong? Christianity. The Bible. The Bible says, no, it's wrong. You sometimes feel like the whole world's against you and your faith. That's because Christianity alone stands up and says there is a better way to live. And it's, if more people followed it, society would be better off for it. That's why we are to go out there and take it. Take it to that world and share it. I had a friend who was one of the very earliest, earliest teachers of apologetics, and that does not mean I'm sorry. It means that you make a reasoned or rational defense of something, and in this case, it was the Christian faith. Another gentleman who I don't know very well, but he is all about evangelism. He's quite famous for it. And for him, it's all about evangelism preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. And they were having a debate because one wanted to teach apologetics fervently and the other one saying, you're wasting your time. We just need to be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the one gentleman turned to me, every bit chance, you know, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, turns to me, a big guy, he's like 6'8", very intimidating. He says, which of us is right? And I, you know, very solemn ass said, yes. You're both right. And he, how that be? And I said, you're right, Mark, in that we should all be bold witness for, for Christ. We should be out there preaching the gospel and making a defense. The problem is he's right because we won't do what you want us to do until we're confident we're right and capable and armed and ready to go out and do it. In the meantime, we just stay on the bench because we're afraid to get in the game because we're not sure we got all the answers for the questions we might hear. And so you're both right. You need him teaching us apologetics, emboldening us, preparing us, and getting us ready to go out there. And we need you to tell us, get out there. Because it takes both. Because we sit here and it's easy. We're surrounded by our peers, like-minded believers. It's not as easy in the workplace. It's not as easy as the water cooler. It's not as easy talking to your kids and grandkids. Just believe it because I do. We'll not cut it. You have to have an answer. And the difference a worldview makes is because in a society that doesn't want to say everything is right, only the Christian worldview defends it. So... Are we in trouble? Is there a battle for your mind? Yes. Is it too late? No. How can I say that? Well, let's go back and read number six of what we believe as Christians. We serve an awesome, all-powerful, all-knowing God that still rules the universe yet today. And our Bible tells us that all things are possible through, well, you know the end of the sentence. Because we believe that, we have hope. We have a new hope that we can find in Christ. But we are called, called to be busy. You remember the spies when they went out? There was only two, I think it was Joshua and Caleb, that came back and said, yeah, we can do it. You remember the names of the others? Didn't put them in the book. David's brothers stayed up on the hill, didn't take up their sword and go out there to face Goliath. Remember their names? Didn't make the book. History doesn't remember wimps, it remembers the bold. 
That's a fact. Do we live in challenging times? Yes, we do. But we serve an awesome God. And he's calling us to be a bold witness for the church of Jesus Christ. Those who cave, capitulate, accommodate, they won't be remembered. So I pray he finds us faithful. And I pray that he finds us willing because what we have is worth fighting for and it's worth sharing. And we are living in a world that desperately in need of the love and the light that only the church of Jesus Christ can bring to a society. Thank you for your time.